My name is Father Dan Canberra, and I'm a Marian of the Immaculate Conception, the religious community that operates the National Shrine of Divine Mercy here in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Very often people ask me why I think St. Faustina is such an important saint. Well, it's because I know that she received some extraordinary graces in her lifetime. Graces beyond compare with any other saint. Now that sounds like a pretty bold statement, I know. But I'd like to read to you two passages out of the diary of St. Faustina and then reflect on them with you briefly. At paragraph 1572, Faustina records the words of Jesus concerning the hour of mercy, the three o'clock hour in the afternoon. I remind you, my daughter, that as often as you hear the clock strike the third hour, immerse yourself completely in my mercy, adoring and glorifying it. Invoke its power for the whole world and particularly for poor sinners. For at that moment, mercy was opened wide for every soul. In this hour, you can obtain everything for yourself and for others for the asking. It was the hour of grace for the whole world. Mercy triumphed over justice. My daughter, try your best to make the stations of the cross at this hour, provided that your duties permit it. And if you're not able to make the stations of the cross, then at least step into the chapel for a moment and adore in the blessed sacrament my heart, which is full of mercy. And should you be unable to step into the chapel, immerse yourself in prayer there where you happen to be, if only for a brief instant. I claim veneration for my mercy from every creature, but above all from you, since it is to you that I have given the most profound understanding of this mystery. Several pages later, after Faustina has been praying the Stations of the Cross every day of her life at the three o'clock hour, as Jesus invited her to do, she finds herself in her deathbed. And as she is dying of tuberculosis, she is at the point of coughing up a great deal of blood and her doctor and Mother Superior agreeing, felt that it was important that she not receive Holy Communion because it would only aggravate and cause her, her body to spit up even more blood. We read at paragraph 1676, her reflection on her own life. Tired, I fell asleep. In the evening, Sister David, who was to look after me, came in and said, Tomorrow you will not receive the Lord Jesus, Sister, because you are very tired. Later on we shall see. This hurt me very much, but I said with great calmness, Very well. And resigning myself totally to the will of the Lord, I tried to sleep. In the morning, I made my meditation and prepared for Holy Communion, even though I was not to receive the Lord Jesus. When my love and desire had reached a high degree, I saw at my bedside a seraph who gave me Holy Communion, saying these words, Behold the Lord of angels. When I received the Lord, my spirit was drowned in the love of God and in amazement. This was repeated the following 13 days, although I was never sure he would bring me Holy Communion the next day. Yet I put my trust completely in the goodness of God. 
but did not even dare to think that I would receive Holy Communion in this way the following day. Sister Faustina goes on to explain what the seraph looked like. And I recommend to you and to everyone else that if you want to know some of the further details, by all means, get your hands on the diary of St. Faustina and read it for yourself. But I'd like to talk to you about the fact that it's a seraph that she sees. There are, according to Pseudo-Dionysus and St. Thomas Aquinas, nine choirs of angels. The highest choir of angels is the seraph, or the seraphim, as they're sometimes called. And the seraphim are the seven angels that stand before the face of God. They all face in towards God, singing his praises night and day. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth is full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Yes, a prophet heard those words and recorded them in the Old Testament for us. And they're now part of the Catholic liturgy at every Mass, borrowed from the Jewish Sabbath synagogue liturgy. I've had more than a few Jewish friends whose eyes suddenly perked up when they heard those prayers, as they recall having heard them in the synagogue first. The seraphim are the highest choir of angels, basing God and singing his praises. They have virtually no contact with humanity. Of course, in the prophet Isaiah's book in the Old Testament, we see that a seraphim is sent from God to Isaiah. When in the sixth chapter, he's called to be a prophet for the Lord. Isaiah says, Lord, I'm an unclean man with an unclean heart and unclean lips, living among unclean people. I'm not worthy to be your prophet. But God says, I will take care of that. And he sends a seraphim who with iron tongs removes a briquette from the altar of incense and with this fiery charcoal touches the lips of Isaiah and says, see by this action, I purge you of your uncleanliness. It is a physical manifestation whose pain and suffering cleanses Isaiah of that which is not clean in him. If you will, it is a reminder to us of the metaphysical fire of purgatory as it purges the hearts and the souls of souls as they get ready to be ushered into heavenly glory. The next time we see a seraphim, it is when St. Francis of Assisi receives a stigmata, which is mediated by the crucified Savior through a seraphim who pierces Francis' hands, feet, and side, and for whom Claire tended him with new bandages on a regular basis. And then the third seraphim, the one who brings Faustina communion not once, twice, or even three times, which would have been extraordinary, but he brings her communion 14 times. I think that's reminiscent of the fact that she prayed the 14 stations of the cross every day at the hour of mercy. She prayed them for friends and family. She prayed them for benefactors. She prayed them most especially for souls who were in the last hour of life. She prayed the stations of the cross for the suffering souls in purgatory, whom she visited. It is important for us to realize 
that she offered these prayers up for everyone she encountered, everyone whom God placed in her life, everyone whose names and desires were presented to her for prayer. You and I can follow that example. When we hear somebody talking about another person who's ill or whose family members are ill, we should pray for them. When we hear in the newspapers or on TV about a tornado or a tsunami or other disasters, we should pray for those people. And every day of our lives, we should pray for those who are in their final hour of life, that they might be prepared well for that personal judgment to which they're headed. And to pray for the souls in purgatory, to pray for all those people whom Faustina would have prayed for if she were by our side, because she is. She, like all the saints, stand with her brothers and sisters, the church militant, and constantly urges us to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and all our strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. Because she is a saint of God, and not just another saint of God, but an extraordinary saint of God. On the occasion of her canonization, Pope John Paul II said that he believed it was for this occasion that he became Pope, that he might declare her the first saint of the third millennium, the saint of the new evangelization, the saint of our age, ours is the time for mercy, and the call to prayer is urgent. Following in the footsteps of Faustina, I urge all of you to have a deep, profound, and tender devotion for the passion of Christ. Console him in his sufferings, and he will ultimately console you in your sufferings. May God bless you and all those whom you love.